So um, the biology of the body of Christ, for some background, for those of you that don't know uh, what this is about, uh, the biology of the body of Christ is something um, that mainly focuses on uh, giving you context for the actual body of Christ, what it should look like, um, how it should function, um, what it what, what is the body of Christ made up of. And uh, because I am a nerd, I am a science nerd, um, I my wires got crossed somewhere in my studies and I began to really actually put actual biology, actual anatomy and physiology to the body of Christ. Um, and so I have all entire series already prepared, but I'm not going to give you all of it because I cannot cover everything in one night. So I'm going to give you the introductory portion of it. Hopefully it will bless you. Hopefully it will help you. Um, and then I'll probably give you a little bit of a taste of the, of the more internal um, aspects of the biology. Uh, but uh, all in all, I, I believe it's going to help you. All right. So yeah, like I said before, share this video, share it with someone you love, share it with someone you hate. Um, and let's get these views up. So definitely tag your friend, send it to somebody. Um, the YouTube link is up. Watch it there as well. Yeah. All right. So let us begin. Let us start. Um, as you guys know also that this the replay will be available on YouTube. So you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe and get that. Uh, but let's pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you and we glorify you for who you are. Oh God, you are great. You are mighty. You are strong. You are true. There is none like unto you. There's none that can compare to you. You are truly our desire, our heart, everything. And Father, we just come tonight searching for more of you, searching for more knowledge, searching for more understanding. So Father, I pray that as I teach tonight, that God, that you would just continue to impart unto your people knowledge and wisdom necessary for the road ahead, necessary for their futures, necessary for everything that you have planned and you have called them to do. So Father, even now I ask, oh God, that you just have your way and that you just do something miraculous tonight. Let the prophetic flow, let the revelatory knowledge flow. God, let uh, the teaching, let the teaching grace flow even tonight, oh Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray tonight that God, that you will let my tongue be of the tongue of the learned. Father, let my hand be of, let my hands and my feet, oh God, be an extension of yours tonight. In Jesus' name, Lord, let my mouth communicate the mysteries of your spirit um, clearly and adequately in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. 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 Like I said before, guys, go ahead and share this video. Tell somebody about it. Um, this is very important. So I want you to be aware of it. Okay. Lit. All right. Biology of the body of Christ. Um, I just prepared a couple, a few notes for you that I think you'll need. Um, and will be helpful to you. Uh, but yeah, um, I want you, I really want you to um, grasp this. Uh, so I just kind of made it more centralized. So let's get into this. Yeah, first, you know, introductory slide. Y'all know what this is, PowerPoint presentation. Sorry, I'm a nerd. Um, next, okay, so what is the body of Christ? Let's really get into this, all right? So the body of, the, the, the body of Christ is the entire host of spirit-filled believers who are being empowered onto the service of Jesus Christ. Now, I really want to bring this out because we use the terms uh, body of Christ, household of faith, things of that nature, very loosely, very interchangeably, and they are different, okay? They are different. The household of God, the household of faith, the body of Christ, all of that, They there are distinctions between who belongs to what, all right? So before we even dissect what makes up the body of Christ, how the body of Christ operates, we, we have to dissect first who makes up the body of Christ. So 1 Corinthians 12 is going to be a very major chapter for us tonight. So I want you to really focus your attention there. Um, the... Uh, the body, the First Corinthians twelve deals with the diversity of uh, the diversities of gifts. What we're, the passage that we're focusing on tonight, well, really the whole chapter focuses on the diversities of gifts, and so this is where we be, we hear Paul talk about um, the one spirit, um, one body, but many members. But I really like this. But the, what what's interesting about this is that when Paul is talking about the body of Christ as it pertains uh, to um, 
as as body of Christ as it pertains to you know believers, we are looking at, at it in the context of the gifted. We are looking at it in the context of those that are operating under the spirit. So this is something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11 to 13. I'm going to read that for you. But all these things worketh that one, that one, all these, but all these worketh that one and the self-same spirit dividing to every man servilely as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. This is extremely important to when we understand the body of Christ. Okay, so Paul is not saying Paul is not saying that we are all um, that we are all in this as in as it pertains to um, just being saved. He says that we are back that by for for by one spirit all we all baptized into one body. Now, I know a lot of you look over that sentence, you're like, okay, so we're all in one body. Okay, but let's be let's look at the text. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. For by one spirit. Now, what is Paul referencing? He's referencing to the gifted, to the Corinthian church. He's not talking to he's not talking to uh, he's not talking to non-believers. He's talking to the church. He's saying that those of you that have been baptized by way of the Spirit, aka who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are now inducted into the body of Christ. Now, this is hard for many to understand because he's like, what are you saying? Because I'm not, because I'm not, I haven't received the baptism of the Holy of, of, of the Holy Ghost, and I'm not um that I'm not in the body of Christ. I'm not saying that you're not saved. You don't have to be, you don't have to have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be saved, but you Receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost inducts you into the body of Christ. You are part of the household of God once you are saved. The household of God is once you're saved. And I'm not even going to get into all of that. And I didn't want to. I didn't add it into the slide package because I did not want to do this. But there is a difference between the household of God and the, and the body of Christ. The household of God is comprised of all of us that believe. The body of Christ is comprised of all of us that have been baptized by way of the Spirit. Okay, and for those, and there is a there is a distinction. There is a distinction, so you have to be aware of that. So the entire host of spirit filled believers who are being empowered onto the service of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ is literally the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in the earth. So that means that in order to be an active part of the body of Christ, you have to be active in service. You have to be active in utilizing the gift that God has given you. Now this. There is a reason why when Paul talks about the body of Christ, he's talking about it within the context of the gifts. Because those that have that have received the gifts of the Spirit are those who have been filled with the Spirit. So in order for you to operate within the context of the body, you have to be Spirit-filled. Okay? All right? Does that make sense? Hopefully I'm not um, like hurting anybody's feelings or anything of that nature. I'm trying my best to be, um, trying my best to be, to be, you know, cool with this. Um, but yeah, it, it requires, it requires you, it requires you, uh, to be filled, to be spirit filled. So that's like one thing that we have to understand, um, and we have to grasp, um, not, there is no segregation as far as those who are spirit filled and those who are not. Uh, but those who are spirit filled, for those of you that understand what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is, you know that we are we are filled with the Spirit of Jesus onto service. We are spilled. We are filled with the Spirit of Jesus to do what He did on the earth. So to be the body of Christ is to literally um, function uh, as Jesus did in the earth. But because we cannot all contain the full, the every single side of how Jesus operated. We are, we are, we are 
occupying members um, and we're going to deal with what those members are and what they look like in certain contexts. Um, but right now, I'm going to I'm going to do I'm not going to go too deep. I promise myself that. But let's get into this. I'm not going to hold you too long tonight. All right. So, all right. We know the body of Christ. Let's go further. Okay. So let's deal with the gifts. Let me shrink myself a little bit so you can see the whole thing. Okay. Let's deal with the gifts. Ministry gifts. Very important. All right. So there, the gifts, the gifts are, there are different types of gifts. There are different um, contexts of gifts. Um, and this is all just background. This is not even the meat of my of my lesson tonight, but I have to give you this background in order for you to understand it. Um, ministry gifts, ministry gifts are listed out in Ephesians chapter four. Um, but here, but there is something that I want to bring out of this passage that I think is very important um, for us to understand as it pertains to what these what these gifts are, what they do, and who they are. Um, imparted to who they are given to by way of the by way of the spirit of the Lord. Um, let me go to Ephesians in my Bible. All right. So, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. All right. So that's this is the this is the this is where the mystery of giftedness as it pertains to the spirit is kind of um, is kind of displayed. Uh, because there are some things here that uh, are seemingly contradictory, but they're not. So, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So that that that's Ephesians chapter four and verse seven. If you read that in the um, if you read that in the NLT version, and I had to really like dive into this to really understand what it was saying by in this passage. If you read that in the NLT, it says, "However, He has given each one of us a special gift." Through the generosity of Christ. So what that what that first bolded part is saying is that each one of us has a gift. All right, each one of us has a gift. Wherefore he said, when he ascended upon high, he let captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So every single person, every single person is given a gift. Every single person that is in Christ is it is given some type of gift. Um, and it comes by way of the spirit, as we said before. All right. Now that he ascended, what is he also ascended? First, blah, 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 blah. he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. That he might. Okay. So this is this is where we understand the the purpose of giftedness as it pertains to the body. All right. Now he has ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill all things not that we might fill all things but that he might fill all things through us so what the bible is saying here is that as he ascended he gives parts of himself unto men giftedness gifts of himself unto men so that that he may fill all things through us so the filling of all things happens by way of the body. You have to be an active part of the body utilizing the gift in order for anything to be filled. And so, and the and this is where we, re, we realize how important it is uh, for our gifts to be utilized in every single aspect of society, every, every aspect of influence, because we, our gifts are not designed just to fill churches. They're designed to fill all things, including education, including, uh, um, including music and industry, uh, including medicine, including the government, every single thing your gift is designed to fill. So, we as the body of Christ, we are an extension of him, okay? So if you are not active in the ministry of Jesus, you are not a part of his body because his body, his body on earth was a gift. And that gift was given unto men so that so that men may be saved and men may be edified. So now we as the collective men and women who have accepted who we are in him, Oh, snap. who have accepted who we are in him and are uh, have said yes to the call to be his, an extension of him in the earth, 
for those of us that have said yes to that, we are literally functioning collectively as Jesus in the earth. Not saying that we are him, but as the, as the Bible said, greater works than, than these shall you do. Literally meaning that you shall do what I do in the earth but because you have me on the inside of you and my abilities and my strengths and what I'm able to impact is now on the inside of you. So when you work together, you are able to fully function uh, within in the full capacity of the ministry of Jesus. So one person cannot fully express the ministry of Jesus. The, it, it takes the entire body. It takes the entire body in, to, to be able to express the full ministry of Jesus Christ in the earth. Okay? So hopefully that did not confuse you too much. I am watching your comments. If this is making sense, let me know. If you're confused, let me know. Um, but let yeah, let, keep keep me abreast of how you guys are feeling. I'm, there's not as much comments going on, so I don't know if you guys are listening or if you're confused or if you love it or if you hate it. Um, but let's see where this goes tonight. All right? Okay, so the famous Ephesians 4.11 says, and he gave some apostles. Now here, this that some is directly, if you're looking at this surface level and out of context of what Paul has taught, this will confuse you. Because in, in verse 7, it says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. But then he says, and he gave some. So what, what, where, where is the some? How come at, some, at one point we have every one of us and then at one point we have some? Every one of us gets a gift, and then here only some of us are only, and then only some of us have a gift. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Woo! I hope you guys are sharing this video. All right, this 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 is. This is this is where we get kind of a kind of kind of confused because if you go back to what we said before, all right, see first Corinthians 12, this 11 to 13, what Paul Paul has said, Paul has said, but all these worketh that that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man. So no, 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 that's not the one. Sorry. Um, let me go back. Okay, but every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. All right, so here we are saying, here we are saying is that at one point, every one of us is given grace. And then at another point, he gives, he gives some. Now, this is where the distinction between gifts has to occur. And this isn't even the meat of my lesson. So let me rush through here. All right, there are ministry gifts and then there are the gifts of the spirit. All right, why? Because these gifts that he has described, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. These gifts are given to the church. Listen, these gifts are are given to the church the perfecting of the saints the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ they are given to the church to perfect to work and to edify its effectiveness okay these gifts are given to the church the gifts of the spirit are given to the world all right the gifts the ministry gifts are given to the church the gifts of the spirit are given to the world. Everyone benefits from the gifts of the spirit. The church benefits from the ministry gifts. Okay, let me give you more clarity. All right, so here we have the gifts of the spirit. All right, first Corinthians 12 again. Like I said, first Corinthians 12 is going to be a major part of our lesson tonight. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences in the ministrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Every man. Every man to profit with all. The gifts of the Spirit are given to the world. 
the gifts of the spirit are given to every man you do not have to be a prophet or an apostle or an evangelist to be gifted many of you are claiming these titles and you are not these titles you are not these gifts you are you are gifted but you are not a gift there is a difference between being gifted and being a gift apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers are people and they are also gifts they are gifts to the church by Jesus in the form of people. But the gifts of the spirit are given to every single man. You can be gifted and not a gift. Okay? So you can have the gift of prophecy and not be a prophet. You can operate in the gift of word of knowledge and word of wisdom and not be a prophet. You can, you can be a great administrator and not be an apostle. Okay. You can have a, you can have the gift. You can have the gift, but not necessarily operate in the office. All right. So what we have to, under, we have to make distinctions in these things because what has happened is that people have tried to, un, tried to get into this, get into the, the Ephesians for, um, under, understanding and, you know, say, Oh, I'm an apostle because I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. But there is no, um, there is no, uh, what I would say, analyzation of, your personhood is you cannot claim an office based upon the gifts that you have there is there is much more to an office than the gifts that you have it goes down into your personhood it goes down into your warfare it goes down into your process but we're going to get into that because i want to i'm going to this is where um the the exciting part happens and things begin to um things begin to get fun all right um Hope you guys are sharing this. All right. Blessings, blessings to all of you that are just coming in. All right. So here we go. Um, where are we at now? All right. So we don't, we mentioned the ministry. Okay. And we talked about the nine gifts. So yeah, these are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. For those of you that didn't know, 1 Corinthians 12. These are the ones that are listed out in 1 Corinthians 12. There are others. You can go to Romans and there's others that Peter, that Peter also lists out. But these are the main nine gifts of the Spirit. All right. Um, and let's get into this. All right. So one thing that, let me go back here. One thing that Paul said in Ephesians, all right. Um, yes, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. All right. Now, this is where we start getting. This is where I'm going to get real revelatory, and this is where the biology comes in. So, don't don't be afraid. Okay. Five. This number five is going to be very in instrumental to you. Um, I believe Paul is using the aspect of what he says, every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. This grace, everyone that knows that the number five um, is the number of grace. And so in this context, we find that the get, how, how Paul describes the offices, he describes them in five, he, divert, he, he, he teaches them and he gives context to them in five um, and it correlates with the actual ministry of Jesus, the grace, okay? So a lot of you say, well, I have an apostolic grace, I have a prophetic grace, I have a pastoral grace, all type of graces and stuff like that. We're gonna get into that. But there is a grace aspect to the fivefold ministry that we have to unpack. Uh, but let's go back. All right, five offices, five wounds, five wars. All right, the number five is going to bless you tonight. So keep it in mind. Five offices, Five wounds, five wars. There are five offices of um five. There's a fivefold office, and there are five wounds that were inflicted upon Jesus in, in five locations, five wounds, and then there are also five wars associated with each office. So I'm going to um I'm going to help you tonight <laughs> because this is where it is going to get a little bit crazy. Um. But, you know, the Lord is good. 
All right, so now let me let me get back to this. So let me, I'm gonna do some, um, yeah, I'm gonna do some work here, all right? So let me turn this on, turn this off and go here. All right. So this is where we're going to have some explanation and I'm going to teach you using these two diagrams and hopefully you will understand what I'm saying. All right. So let me reposition my device. All right. And gee, I'm going to use red because I think red is a good way to depict the wounds of Jesus. So right now we have two, um, we have two bodily, you know, things here. We got, um, uh, got two diagrams, human body. Those of you that know what the human body looks like, you have one, you're in one, so you should know what it looks like. Head, hands, feet, basic. Um, so there are five wounds that Jesus that were inflicted upon Jesus. Um, the And the first one that we're going to deal with right now, so you know what, let me label these first. Um, we're going to make this one the front. We're going to make this one the back. All right, don't laugh at my handwriting. All right, so front, back. The back, Jesus was whipped 49 times on his back, all right? So we got whips. Um, we got all type of stuff going over here. You know, ah, you know, can barely recognize. He was whipped. His back um, was whipped. Um, blood, you know, blood is everywhere. Ah, you know, there, I think I've made my point. So that's his back, all right? Jesus is whipped on his back, um, and he's also, um, he's also, what, where else is Jesus, is Jesus um, wounded? He's wounded on his head, all right? So we have 360 degrees worth of piercing going on around his skull. We also have him being pierced in his hands. He's piercing his hands. Nails go through his hands. Nails um, all the way through, front to back. He's also pierced on his feet. All right? Are we getting this? All right. Make sure you share this. This is good stuff. Listen, you don't... Ah, I love it. I get so excited. All right? Not only that, um, Jesus is also pierced on his side. All right? So we got... Five different places. So this is number one. This is number two. Uh, actually, well, I'm not doing them in order. This is number. Three. I'm just gonna number them. Actually, no. Let me do it. Let me do it in. Let me do it in order. We're gonna make the the crown number two. Number two. Then we have Pastor Dia. Three. Four, and then we have number five right here. All right, got it. Awesome. So Jesus is wounded in five different locations on his body. He is wounded on his back, strikes to the back. He is wounded on his head, crown of thorns. He is wounded on his hands. Hands are pierced. He's wounded in his feet. Feet are pierced. He's also wounded at his side. His side is pierced. Spear goes through his side. All of that. All right? Now, every single one of these wounds correlates to an office. All right? Every single one of these wounds correlates to an office. Now, this is the body of Christ. When he hung on the cross, these what this is what his body looked up looked like. This is what his body entailed of. This was where he was bleeding from. This was where everything was happening at. This 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 is what his body this is what his body looked like. All right. Catch the principle, catch the revelation. The body of Christ can you can we cannot fully depict or 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 be the body of Christ if we do not express his wounds. Paul said 
that I, if, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering in order to, to, to completely and to effectively and accurately be the body of Christ in the earth. We have to also depict and understand and express his suffering. His suffering is found in his wounds. His wounds express, express and are found and are correlated very closely to every single fivefold office. All right? You get me? All right. Now, we got we got this this whole back situation going on, all right? We start real simple. Let me go to let me change my color. All right? We got a whole back situation going on right here. All right, boom, bam. This is the ministry of the apostle. All right, ministry of the apostle. Now, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you context as to why the 49 stripes to Jesus' back represents the, the ministry of the apostle. All right, but understand this, okay? The type of whip that was being used to beat Jesus was a whip that had um had different like stripes and then it had pieces of metal uh at the bottom and when they whipped jesus the 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 pieces of metal would literally pierce his skin all right now looking at this from a medical perspective if anyone was to be beaten like that we could expect there to be damage to the spinal cord we would we could only we could if you are if you are shot in your spinal cord you're paralyzed so if you are if, if imagine now these pieces of sharp metal going into jesus's back we have the spinal cord running down here this is your solar plex type thing i'm trying to make this make sense for those of you that don't understand medical terminology but your spinal cord is connected to your brain this is a brain okay whatever whatever this is your brain now your spinal cord if you're getting you're getting beaten your spinal cord is literally protruding in a sense through your not through your skin but like you can touch you can literally like feel the bone structure where your spinal cord is where the actual the nerves are in in your in your body so if J jesus is being beaten at this at this spot and on this lip on this area of his body now we could expect that there would be some type of nerve damage and that would call and and this is the type of pain that you got to understand if there's nerve damage happening by what by reason of jesus being hit all these being pierced all these times using this this insane whip, then we can expect there to be nerve damage that could be felt throughout his entire body because the the spinal cord is the is what connects like all of your nerves are connected to your spinal cord. Okay, all of them, everything you feel like it is the the brain and the spinal cord are what we call the central nervous system. Okay, so every single Every single nerve in your body is connected to this central nervous system. That's why it's central. And so if there was damage to this part of Jesus' body, the central part of Jesus' body, then that would mean that every single part of him would be able to feel and understand, uh, not understand, but to feel and, and express and the pain that he was feeling from this very spot. So we could we could we could easily assume that this part of Jesus' torture was by far the most painful because it affected every single part of his body. The fact that he was able to walk after this is actually a miracle. Because if you could if if, if when people if a bullet hits your spinal cord in the in in, in like the right position you're paralyzed so for him to get repeated abrasions to this part of his back this that would mean that there is significant damage to his entire body to his entire nervous system to his motor skills to everything okay um all right so that makes sense hopefully i'm not like you know confusing you yeah straight nerve pain like it's straight 
it's straight like this 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 man is incapacitated straight nerve pain there that that part of his body would ex would like even even with the bone structure protecting the actual nerves with that much abrasion there has to be some type of nerve damage okay so now with that being said the reason why we 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 equate this we correlate this wound to the apostles is because your, ner your central nervous system, your spine, is connected to every single part of your body. To your brain, to the nerves in your hands, to the nerves in your feet. Every single, every time you touch something, that, that sensation goes from your, the nerves in your fingertips to your spinal cord and up to your brain. Everything that is in the brain is communicated to the brain by way of the spinal cord. All right? The apostle, as it pertains now to the body of Christ is the office that holds everything else together all right catch the revelation all right catch the revelation the apostles are what hold like it in the context of the hand right we talk about the body of christ you know the hand everything like that all right this is the apostle the thumb the thumb holds everybody else together the apostle is what plays is what manages is he the apostle is is what um delegates and governs the rest of the body okay the apostle is who governs the rest of the body or everything that the body is doing it can and um, even inter member um relationships and, and 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 integration happens because of 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 your it, it cannot happen without your spinal cord because in order for your hand your hands to work together on this side of your body and that side of your body to do a thing. It has to be communicated to your brain to the spinal cord. Your spinal, like the way that your body is able to function as one unit is by way of your brain and that, and that communication happens to the spinal cord. Okay, so it's very, 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 very important. Very important that we understand that. Your spinal cord is important to the entire functionality of your body without a spinal cord the body is paralyzed if there's damage to the spinal cord your body is paralyzed without apostolic ministry the body is pet there is con no communication between the feet and the hands and the hands and the brain and the brain and the digestive system there is no communication that's why when people get shot in their spinal cord they're they're basically in a vegetative state because there is no more nerve communication with the rest of your body and your brain okay so it's extremely it's extremely important the rest of the body is governed by the apostle oh crap Governed by the apostle. Okay, let's take it further. All right. Now, deal with the apostles. Let's deal with. Right? Yeah. You know what? Let me not be like such a total terrible person as it pertains to this stuff. Let me try to write neatly. All right. Let's zoom in a little bit. There you go. All right. Now, crown of thorns. Crown of thorns. 360 around Jesus, like so, an entire thorn apparatus structure being made into the size of Jesus' head, being wrapped around his head and fastened on his head and pushed down on his head. It pierces the skin around his skull. Now he is bleeding from his head, like his head, right? He's not bleeding from his brain, he's bleeding from his head. All right, because of the skull, we don't. We there's no there's no way to say that there be any damage to his actual brain. That's not that's not what we're saying. But we're saying that there's definitely bleeding coming from his head. All right, there's blood coming from his head. Now this is we gotta focus on where is, where blood is actually gushing from. Blood is gushing from his head. Okay. Now the prophets, the prophets are now. Let's deal with this. Okay, let's this is the back. Let's go to the front because over here is blank. Now the prophets. What are the prophets? The prophets are the mouthpiece of God. Alright. You got the mouthpiece right there. Mouthpiece of God. Uh we hear from God. Hearing. Alright? We got eyes. Eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the good and the evil. Alright? 
Now, right? So we got boom. We got eyes. So we got the mouthpiece. All right. Then we got the ears, and then we got the eyes. All right. Now, I'm not going to get too much into this because this is where we get into. This is a this is part of my prophetic training course. All right. So this this is one of the things that reasons why prophets are not better than any and are not better than the rest of the body or better than the rest of the household of God but are different because the difference is is that this right now is the head right so the prophets the war that comes against the prophets is happening in this cranial space in this cranial space now like I said, we got five offices, five wounds, five wars. Every single wound correlates with a war, and that and that will give you context of what that office is. So, uh, like little, you know, point to be made. One of the ways to identify an office is to identify the war. Okay, the one of the best ways to identify an office. Is to identify the war okay there is a war that goes that comes to the apostles that does not come to the prophets the prophets have a totally different war than the apostles now if you could guess what type of war is coming from bleeding up here okay you're bleeding up here where your brain is where your cognizance is where your where your interpretation is all of that when you deal when you think when you think about the warfare that happens up here you realize why so many prophets go crazy you re hey, glory you re you realize why so many prophets are losing their minds minds my, look at that look at that why so many prophets lose their minds the warfare of the prophet does not happen where it happens where it doesn't happen the same way for the apostles. It doesn't happen the same way for the evangelists. It doesn't happen the same way for the pastors. It happens in the head. Okay? Because that's where we sit. That's where we operate from. We operate out, we operate in the eyes. We operate in the mouth. We operate uh, in the ears. We operate in the sensory parts of, uh, of the body. Okay? So we see afar off. We hear in the spirit. We speak the word of God. And those type and those aspects being in the head un invite a certain type of warfare that happens in the mind. Okay? All right? Every single wound of Jesus correlates with the war that he had to face. Okay? And this is also why, let me deal with this, this is why there's no human being on earth that can walk in all five offices. There is no human being on earth that can walk in all five offices. Why? Because you could not, you cannot manage the warfare that comes with all of these offices. Two or three at most, but you cannot do all of them. You cannot do all of them. You cannot do all of them. This is why you cannot operate all five. Anybody that says, well, I'm an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. No, 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 no. You're not. You cannot be all five. Because if you were all five, that means that you've been wounded in all five places. And if that was the case, then you would, you, you, would, you would probably jump off a building. All right? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it, okay? Um, all right, so I'm gonna get back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal with the, the apostle prophet um, relationship in a bit, but let's go to the pastors. Pastors are in the hands, okay? Pastors are in the hands. All right, got it. Pastors are in the hands. Pastors. Now, why are pastors the hands? Because pastors have to, pastors are the relational office. They are the hands on office. Uh, pastors are the type of people that will use their hands, use their, their relationship with you to minister to you. The pastors are the hands-on office of the body of Christ. 
So uh, we, when we talk about, um, you know, like, oh, we're, we're the hands of Jesus. We're talking about extending his, like literally extending the hand of compassion, extending the hand of relationship, extending the hand of friendship, uh, and the war that comes with that comes to pastors, and it's very and it's not as deep as it is. The war that comes to pastors. Jesus was piercing his hands. He was a hands-on type of type type of type of guy. He was a hands-on preacher. He was a hands-on person. Jesus was a pastor. Jesus walked in all five offices of walked in all five offices, all five four offices of the spirit. He was an apostle. He was a prophet. He was a pastor. Being a pastor, being pierced in your hands represents and it is a sign it signifies the warfare that comes against relationships. Okay? One of the one of the biggest ways to wound a pastor is to bite his hand. Okay? The one of one of the biggest one of the worst ways to wound a pastor is to bite his hand. You know that sentence says, don't bite the hand that feeds you. Because pastors have to feed you with their hands. They don't they don't they 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 don't feed you using an apparatus or you pastors will feed you with their hands. But what if you ever don't like seen up like how a shepherd um nurses or like or take care of sheep, they'll start by actually holding the sheep, carrying the sheep, feeding the sheep like like it's a baby because a shepherd has to be a hands-on uh, a type of person in order to properly groom the sheep. Now, when a pastor is wounded, they are wounded in their hands. They are wounded uh, because at some point or in some place, somebody pierced, somebody bit, somebody wounded their hands, and now their ability to extend their hands to other people is now you know, daunted. That's why, like, you've seen so much pastoral trauma and things of that nature because pastors, a lot of times, the trauma that they face comes when um, someone that they love, someone that they cared for, someone that they handled very closely, um, either wound, either, you know, wounds them, tries to, um, try, uh, bites them, uh, pierces like all type of this, you know, portray betrayal, uh, you know, rumors, gossip. When you when you hurt a pastor, um, what happens? The effect of that is is that the pastor begins to draw back their hands. Now I'm no longer as hands on as I used to be uh, because of what somebody said to me or what that person did to me. I'm not able to handle people as closely as I would love to or as my heart would want me to because now I am, I, it hurts, you know, like my hands are wounded. I'm not able to handle people properly. And so when you have wounded hands, when a pastor has wounded hands, what happens, happen, what happens many of the times is that they mishandle sheep. When your hands are wounded, you mishandle sheep, Okay. That is why it is so important. That is why it's so important for pastors to have proper counsel and to have people around them that will not allow them to fall into that place where they're no longer using their hands to shepherd people. Okay? Pastors that are no longer hands on are pastors um, that have been wounded. And what has happened many times is that we have taken that title of pastor. And I want to deal with this because now our churches are extremely pastoral and evangelistic. Okay. So we ignore three and like, and like three whole parts of the fivefold. Um, because, you know, we're focused like, we're, we're focused on being hands and feet, literally, because, you know, the next part is evangelist and evangelist on feet. Um, but we're literally hands and feet, but we're not eyes. We're not ears. We're, we're, we're not. Um, we're not spine, we're not spine, we're not skeleton, we're not anything else, we're just hands and feet, you know what I'm saying? And when the hands are wounded and there is no um, grace or there is no, um, there is no ministry coming from any of the other five, coming from the apostle, coming from the prophet, um, then what you will find is that, that this, the hands become, uh, become, they become wounded and then they'll become dirty. 
uh, because they're no longer they're no longer um, doing what they were what they were made to do. Past born pastors, pastors that are given by Jesus, are born with hands that are designed to handle the sheep. Okay, all right. So I hope that like helps with some pastors. Like when you find yourself withdrawing your hand, withdrawing your hand, your hands. You need both hands to pastor. You do not use your hands, um, then you're not, you're not going you're not going to be properly handle sheep, okay? And many of you have been mishandled by pastors because of trauma like this that has not been dealt with, okay? Um, <laughs> Someone says people be out here envying these gifts. Listen, they do. They envy them. People want. People want them, but you know, it's, it is what it is. All right. So let's move on. Evangelists. Evangelists are the feet. And many of you would probably know why the evangelists are the feet. Evangelists are the feet. Let's deal with the feet. Boom. Again, don't judge my handwriting. Evangelists. Evangelists. Um, now, the pastors and the evangelists are the most external of the fivefold. Okay? These are the most external. Your hands and your feet are your most sensory. Like, that's how you touch. That's how you sense things. You, If you want to know what's going on around you, you use your hands and your feet. All right? So, um, these too touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Um, the Bible says that Jesus Jesus was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, meaning that he was able to empathize with what we felt, and he and he was able to do that using his pastoral and evangelistic offices, those parts of him, because of hands and feet. All right. These are the external extensions of the body um, that you need. Um, in order to really be effective and to actually impact people, um, all of the, all of the offices impact people, of course. But here's the thing: without the oversight of these two right here, of like these two right here, it's very it's very difficult to raise up these two, like a like healthy like effectual versions of you know of these two right here if these two are not operating in synergy as we see with the connection of the brain and the spinal cord then these two are going to have a hard time um actually being effective so that's why we have evangelists that think that they're pastors and pastors that think that they're evangelists because there's no definition first of all if there's no apostolic ministry you're gonna everyone's gonna be confused about who they are all right but you know Let's, let's, let's go. Evangelist. Warfare of the evangelist is very similar uh, to that of the pastor. Pierced all the way through the feet. You are wounded in your feet. Now, one of the biggest, um, like, I, the warfare that comes against the evangelist. The biggest, most scariest devil, demon that comes against evangelists is stagnation stagnation evangelists hate stagnation evangelists cannot breathe cannot live in stagnation evangelists are mobilizers they are always moving um if any part of them if if any um if any part of their armor is, you know, if any part of their, if they have any type of spiritual armor on, it is the feet shall with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because they are the feet of the church. They are the movement. They're the ones that go. They're the ones that will push the body into different locations. Now, a, a, a very interesting thing to point out 
about the evangelist. As we said before, if your spinal cord, if your spinal cord is shot, if you get shot in your spinal cord, you are paralyzed. If you are paralyzed, you cannot move. If you cannot move, then this office is going to suffer the most. This office is going to suffer the most. Okay? Pastors don't mind staying in the house. Prophets don't mind not leaving the house. Apostles don't mind not leaving the house. Evangelists will get upset. Okay? Evangelists are very particular. They're very, they're very unique in their aspect in the body of Christ. So if this, if this, if the apostle is not, if if the if the apostle is not functioning properly, then the evangelist will not have a sense of direction. Okay? Now think of, now think about this. The evangelist just wants to move. The apostle is going to give the evangelist direction where to move. Because, but to know that direction comes from the prophets. The prophets are the ones that guide, right? Apostles govern, prophets guide, evangelists gather, pastors. What did the pastors do again? I forgot what the G for the pastors was. And teachers ground. I forgot. I forgot what the G for the pastors was, but back here. <laughs> but yeah, the prophets are the guy are the guidance counselors. They are the guidance people, right? Now the prophet prophets know the way. Prophets communicate with the apostles. The apostles begin to communicate that direction to the to the rest of the body. Now this, in order for the evangelist to know where to go, the apostle has to communicate direction. That is why. Rogue evangelists are his nuisance in the body of Christ. And the warfare that comes against you. What? The devil? Oh. <laughs> the warfare that comes against evangelists uh, is stagnation. They want to move. They want to, they want to get out there. They want to do, they want to. Because if an evangelist is not moving, if an evangelist is not, is not, in different places, um, bringing people into the household of faith, then they start to fall into carnality. Um, they start to fester. They start to cause issues. Like you ever, like you, the people in church that you find are like, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't care what we do, but I don't, I don't see the point of having of, of doing this because who did anyone get saved? Did anybody get saved? Who's getting saved from this? Are we inviting the lost? Are the lost gonna be there? Are we gonna evangelize? Why are we evangelizing? Like the, the, the evangelist is just is, is gung ho on getting people saved. That's what evangelists do. And when their feet are wounded, then what you find is that they begin to they begin to fester. They begin to like. They just begin to get angry. They begin to get very discontent. They begin to get irritated. They got to leave. They just got to go. And without the evangelist, the body would not have the mobilization. Because without without evangelists, the church is literally not going anywhere outside of his comfort zone. The evangelists are designed to move the church out of his comfort zone, to move the church out of complacency. So like... um. When you find that someone begins to like ruffle feathers and kind of like you know say like we gotta move here, we gotta, this is where God like that is part of the evangelistic um, grace that is say we gotta go, we gotta move this over here. Like what we're doing right now is not working, so we just gotta move over here. Like this is evangelists are extremely um, are extremely. Uh, fixated on outreach are fixated on moving out of the of the four walls you know like it's crazy um but the event you'll find that the evangelists are very closely related to the apostles there is a apostolic aspect to event to evangelistic ministry um but let's not confuse um evangelist evangelicity licitcity with uh, itinerant, itinerant preaching, okay? Evangelism and itinerant preaching are two different things, okay? Evangelism and itinerant preaching are two different things. You can be itinerant and not an evangelist, okay? You could be an itinerant prophet, you could be an itinerant apostle, you could be an itinerant pastor, but you don't, you don't, does that does not make you an evangelist. All of us have the capacity to evangelize, 
but that does not make us evangelists. Okay? All right. Um, let's deal with the teachers. The teachers are slept on, but they are actually like extremely important. Um, teacher. Yes. Teachers, all right? Boom. Now, teachers, what does teaching, what do the teachers have to do with being pierced in the side? I know what you're thinking. Let me help you, all right? Teachers, what happened when Jesus was pierced in the side? All right? So we know that coming out. Let. There you go. Right? Also, what else was coming out? Water. Well, that this is the most ignored um, office. All right? Got it? Does it look okay to you? One of the most ignored, one of the most bypassed, but it is one of the most important. Now, Jesus was pierced in the side. Out of his side came blood and water. In order for this to happen, biologically, he would have to have been pierced and his stomach would have had to have been punctured. So literally everything that was in him, like the water that he was like, it just started to flow out, right? Now, this was, this is speaks to a little bit more of a complex system in the body, which is the digestive system. Your digestive system, what you eat is so important. Teachers are the ones that are going to ground you in sound doctrine, are going to ground you in scriptural truth are going to ground you in a revelation and wash you with the word wash you with the word you will not be an effective disciple until you have been taught well the ignorance that we find in the body of Christ is because people are not taught. The, re, the, the, the absence of teachers, the absence of teachers is the reason why the spirit of religion is so rampant in the body. And I said the body. Why? Because religion thrives off of ignorance. Religion thrives off of misinterpretation. Religion thrives off of eisegesis. So if I'm not being properly taught, if I'm not being properly washed in the word of God, if I'm not being properly given the truth revelation, then I'm going to formulate a conclusions about Jesus that are not scriptural, that are not accurate, and are at, and at the end of the day, detrimental to my development. Okay? This speaks to your digestive uh, digestive system, okay? What you digest, so it's consumed in your mouth. It goes to your esophagus, goes to your, your um, goes to your stomach, and then you got other organs and glands that filter out um, that filter out nutrients and things of that nature, and are able uh, uh, to to what happens in your in your stomach really is what happens is that your body begins to absorb the good nutrients that you need to live and begins to excrete the bad things the waste that you don't need all right and these things are filtered through your kidneys and your liver and things of that nature but what happens in your stomach is that it, there the what is it, things are broken down first of all food is broken down um, and nutrients are absorbed. This happens in your stomach and it also happens in your small and large intestines. But, you know, this is not biology class, but I'm just trying to give you context to why we are in this space. Okay? So here's the thing about, this here's the thing about teachers. Teachers are going to take, 
this big old piece of meat right here meat bread whatever you want to call it and break it down and break it down so that you are able to digest it and not only digest it but absorb its nutrients without this part of the body in full operation this your the body cannot grow not in size not in not in like not, i'm not talking about population i'm talking about in spirituality without teachers you cannot grow without proper digestion if you don't eat you don't grow so if you are going to it so the thing about teachers why teachers are so important to the aspect of the fivefold ministry is that they are what they are what a di digest and break down and absorb and reproduce revelatory knowledge so that we can be we can be uh, uh, uh we can we can we can consume it and so and that we can grow from it all right when 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 timothy was when timothy when paul was admonishing timothy he was he told him that you you're he's confident in him because he has been taught the scriptures not preached the scriptures not not read the scriptures but he has been taught the scriptures the pre the teachers the teachers are the ones that give us biblical understanding, knowledge, and principle necessary to be to grow, to be fed, and to grow. So when so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Preachers, preachers are supposed to to have aspects of this. Okay aspect of this go out to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature teaching them to very everything that i commanded you so there in in the great commission there's an aspect of preaching and teaching preaching should not be done without teaching teaching should also not be done without an aspect of preaching because act preaching is declarative and teaching is informative. You need both to win people. Okay? Ugh, I hope I'm not boring you. But, you know, it's Revelation X, so, you know, I'm not going to be on here much longer. <laughs> but, yeah, very important. Like, you need, you need, as a preacher, you need to have aspects of teaching. You need to have aspects of preaching. As teachers, you need to have aspects of preaching and you need to have aspects of teaching. Um, but it's extremely important. Now, what we have done in the body of Christ is that we have ordained, uh, we've ordained this, we've ordained, we've commissioned these people, we've ordained these people, a lot of these people, We've ordained these people, and we've totally ignored these people. And that is why we're so ignorant. That is why we're so ignorant. And so what what, what has had to happen is that we've had to literally, um, we, we have people that are preached at every Sunday, but are not fed because they're not taught anything. All right? I think I think I'm I think I'm making sense here. So, all right. Before I get rid of this um, diagram, does anyone have any questions? Any um, any concerns so far? Let me um let me go back to my screen. All right, I know that was a lot that I just did. <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions before I um, before I dive off into other things as well? <laughs> okay. 
All right, so we seem to be in a good place. All right, anyone on YouTube, anyone on Facebook? Any questions or concerns? Hopefully that made some sense to you. Um, now, this is why five, four, and it, when when we when you look at that, when you when you observe that, what we just discussed, the diagrams, everything, apostles, prophets, fans, pastors, and teachers, right? Deal with their warfare. Deal with their um, their locations on the body and everything like that, and why it's important. Now you understand why you cannot be the body of Christ without fivefold ministry. Again, say it with me. Say it with me. You cannot be the body of Christ without fivefold ministry. Because the body of Christ is not the body of Christ without the wounds of Christ. And, there are, and the wounds of Christ are, ex, are, are correlated, are linked, are connected to each of the fivefold ministry. All right. So now let me, let me, all right, someone just, um, came on late. Where did you label apostles? Okay, let me go back then. And let me go back and um, deal with it. All right. Why is it? Okay, here we go. Apostles are right here. Apostles. Um, the apostles are the wound for the apostles are the. Um, are the stripes that Jesus received to his back. The stripes that Jesus received to his back are the wounds of the apostles. And um, just to give some context to that, the apostles are what keep the body connected, are what um, govern the rest of the body. Um, they are the central part of the body. Every single person, every single office needs and needs, needs to be connected to an apostle. Um, and so it is It is important. So that happens by way of the central nervous system. Um, all of your nerves connect back to your, your spinal cord. And so um, the, wound, the wound of the apostle is one that is felt throughout the entire body. Um, an apostle, the, and like this is why when people covet apostolic ministry, or say I want to be an apostle. It, it it really baffles me because the pain of an apostle is not just felt um, in one place; it's felt everywhere. Because once you get nerve damage, your whole body is 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 affected. And so, um, a wound, the warfare that comes against the apostle comes literally from every direction. It comes from every direction. In some in some aspect, um, an apostle's uh, psychological warfare will not be as intense as a prophet's psychological warfare, but they will experience some of it because the apostle is connected, um, literally connected, like neurologically, uh, to every single other part of the body. The wound of the apostle is felt throughout the body. All right, so um, an apostle's warfare is going to be it's going to be multifaceted. It's going to be in every area, and they're like they're going to feel it. In, they're going to feel it in their in their. In, they're going to be feel it in stagnation. They're going to feel it in in you know hands on relationships with people. They're going to feel it in psychological warfare. They're going to feel it. Um, in the ignorance and the lack of uh, revelation in the body, uh, there's, there's going to feel it everywhere, and so that's why apostles are apostles do not occupy all fivefold five offices, but an apostle can tap into the grace attached to each um, to each office because they are connected to each office. Okay, so that's something to understand. 
Your spinal cord is not your hands, but your spinal cord can feel what the hand feels because they are neurologically connected. All right. Yeah. The pressure comes from everywhere. So for those of you that are called to be apostles, congratulations. You know, you played yourself. <laughs> you know, you didn't play yourself, but you know, God bless you. Um, da -da 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 Someone else asked, um, uh, who else? How does someone know they are destined to be a teacher in the body of Christ um, versus them being a prophet? A prophet and an apostle. Okay, a prophet and a, a, a teacher. Okay, here's the thing. Like I said, you identify your office by your ward. So now, if I'm a prophet, I should have the gift of prophecy. All right. Well, ooh, let me not miss this mic. Uh, if I'm a if I'm a prophet, well, I should have the gift of prophecy, but it's not necessarily a gift for the prophets. Prophets don't really have the gift of prophecy. The prophets have a prophetic spirit. That's a total. That's I'm not focusing on prophets get all of my attention, okay? I'm, I'm trying to be equal. I'm trying to divert all of my teaching time to everybody, not just the prophets. But the prophets are different because the prophets are first, okay? Um, and it correlates with this again, first of all, because in embryonic stages, when, when, you know, when your mother got pregnant with you and you were developing in your mother's womb, one of the first things that developed in her um, the first thing that you developed was neurons, was 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 your brain. That was a, your head. Uh, that's the, one of the first parts that was developed, and your brain, um, you know, started to, to to formulate because your brain is needed to regulate your heartbeat and everything like that and whatever, all those things. So your brain is one of the first things that gets that gets developed in the human body when you're in you know your embryonic zygote stages. Things that I don't remember from bio one, but um it's one of the first things that get developed and so it makes sense that the prophets are the oldest office in the bible all right the prophets are the oldest, are oldest office in the bible um and so first of all prophets have to be born they cannot be made you have to be born a prophet so if you're a prophet you would know and you can always there are different ways the biblical way to know that you're a prophet is that the lord will get will show will tell you in a dream or a vision, as Deuteronomy would declare. Um, but you can also tell that you are called, you are a prophet by the warfare that you endure. Prophetic warfare um, is, you know, people say, oh, you know, a demon's come attack me in my dreams and, um, you know, Jezebel's trying to kill me. That's not really like the sign that you are a prophet. The sign that you are a prophet is that your, your warfare is completely psychological. Your warfare is psychological. Um, the crown of thorns, um, and you know we can go deeper into that. The crown of thorns was placed on Jesus's head as a to mock him, to say, "Oh, this is the king of the Jews." So we put a crown on his head, and then put a crown of thorns as a way to mock Jesus's identity. And so, um, what they were trying to do was attack who he was, attack who who he was, what he who he was born to be, what he was born to do, and so. Um, we will find with the prophets, the devil will literally try to put a crown of thorns on your head and try to make you believe that you are somebody that you're not or make you doubt your identity or make you doubt your purpose. And so that's why one of the first things that a prophet has to learn um, and, and growing into uh, maturity and growing into who they're called to be is um, identity. You have to know who you are. You have to know who you are. You have to take off the crown of thorns literally and put on the crown of righteousness. Um, but that's prophetic training. Um, teachers. Mm. Teachers. <laughs> A teacher is going to be one that is that is focused more, more so on development than they are on manifestation. Um, the the pro pastors and pastors and, and evangelists are extensions they are extensions the apostles the prophets and the teachers are more so internal okay they're more so internal um that is why you know what I, 
have to go back. I have to look for it. But where Paul talks about um, some of the different gifts that were extended. Um, was that in First Corinthians 12? If I could find this, it will really bless you as it pertains to this. Uh, that's one of the seven Corinthians. Okay, yeah. First Corinthians 12, like I said, very important. First Corinthians 12 and um, 28, and God hath set some in the church, in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers. The apostles and prophets and teachers are internal offices. They operate from the inside out. Pastors and evangelists operate from the outside in. Oh, I blessed you. I know I did. That that's revelation. That that blessed me. And I I I I wrote this curriculum. God has set some in the church. Read it. First Corinthians twelve and twenty eight. Apostles, prophets, teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? You know, everything. But it's but one of the things that Paul signifies here is that in the church are apostles, prophets, teachers. And then after that, there are the, there are many gifts. In the church are apostles, prophets, and teachers. Apostles, prophets, and teachers are internal gifts. They, op they operate from the inside out. Okay, they are internal and their in, in, internal manifestation manifests outward, but the pastors and evangelists are outside in. Okay, they are outside in. Another thing to uh, also to note about the pastors that the pastors, shepherds, um, we make them very passive, but they're not. Um, they're not always passive because pa shepherds, the pastors, the hands also have have, have to be. Um, war, war um, oriented. Um, if you remember David, when he was fighting um, as a shepherd boy, the, he, the Bible says that he would fight lions and bears with his bare hands. As a shepherd, you have to be a guard. That's what I missed. Ah, the pastors guard. Sorry, pastors guard. Apostles govern. <laughs> uh, prophets guide. Uh, pastors guard, evangelists gather, teachers ground. That's the that's the five G's. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I forget that. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's extremely extreme. The and and this is why. We, and when we understand this, we can relate better as ministry gifts because at that point we understand that the event the the, the need for the evangelists and the pastors to reach out is not going to be this at the same intensity as it is for the apostles, prophets, and teachers. Okay? The ones that are given in our God has set some in the church, in, in, internally, in the church, apostles, prophets, and teachers. The extensions of the church are the pastors and evangelists. Okay? So and I'm a, let me go back because, you know, I don't want y'all looking at my diagram and, you know, whatnot. But one of the, one of the things that we got to understand is that, um, okay, I'm looking at your questions. I'm sorry. Michael Hinton said, so a church is severely deficient when apostles and prophets aren't present or is it just the body of Christ in general? Um... Yeah, when apostles and prophets are pre present, the body of Christ is extremely handicapped um, because we're trying to be extensions. We're trying to be we're trying to be external without being internal. Okay, and so I'm trying to reach out to people and bring them into a system that is not set in order. Um, so that's why a lot of our evangelistic initiatives fail. Um, because we're trying to we're trying to reach out without actually reaching in at the same time. When you have prop, when you have a healthy apostolic, prophetic, and didactic ministry in the church, then your outreach, your extensive, your external ministry gifts 
will it will be healthy as well. Because at the end of the day, pastors and evangelists are not going to be as effective as they could be without the ministry of the apostles and the prophets, because that's going to give them direction, give them covering, give them um, guidance, give them um, holistic um, ideology for what they're doing. And of course, the teacher is always going to give them more revelation, which is going to grow them, which is going to nourish them. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's making sense to you. <coughs> mm. So, um, and this is, and this is where I'm going to, this is going to be my last point for the night. Yep. <sighs> this is going to be my last point for the night. Boom, 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 boom. Let's go over here. Why, why am I like this? Sorry, guys. Let me go back to sorry. For some reason, I don't know what it is. Yeah. This. <laughs> All right, cool. Central nervous system. Now, this there there's aspects of this teaching where I talk about the various um, organ systems of the body and the ministries and the gifts that correlate with them. But um, the central nervous system is the apostles and prophets. Okay, Ephesians two nineteen and twenty says, "Now therefore ye are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God." The saints and the household of God, there is a distinction, but we're not going to go there, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, if you go further, if you go further in that, in that, uh, in Ephesians 2, um here we go. Ephesians 2 20 and um in 21 says in whom all the building fitly framed together onto an holy temple in the Lord. Now the idea of a house, the house of God, the church, the believers, you know, things of that nature, um that part of the that part of of what we understand to be the church is built upon apostles and prophets the foundation of every church should be apostolic and prophetic okay we cannot build churches off of pastoral and evangelistic ministry and and after i'm i'm hope i'm hoping after viewing and understanding this that you understand why that's impossible it's not possible for a church to be built only off of pastors and evangelists. It is, it, is, it is completely external and not internal. What happens when you have nothing but pastors and evangelists is that you, you, you're, 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 very, you're very gathering guard oriented. So you bring people in and you'll keep them in, but you won't disciple them. You won't grow them. You won't, um, you won't push them. You won't elevate them. And so what happens a lot of times is that we have large churches that are completely pastoral, completely evangelistic, no apostolic or prophetic or didactic influence whatsoever. And then what happens is, is that the people do not grow past the point of which they, of which they were saved. And so we have a lot of people um, that are baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, and that's the only revelation of Jesus that they understand baptized, saved, and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's it. You have no further revelation of who you are um, and what you're called to, um, where you're going, um, what you're supposed to be doing in the earth, what your, what, your, um, what your purpose is because you're saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And because pastors are guardians, they will 
they rather keep you in that place than allow you to explore outside of that realm. But when pastors are not properly covered and checked by apostolic prophetic ministry, then you find there to be a lot. It, it can turn into witchcraft. And that's, <clears throat> oh, and that is why um, a lot of pastors with the guardian nature have the capacity to become um, very controlling and manipulative because you're just trying to guard, you're just trying to keep them, you're just trying to keep them in, you're just trying to keep them, um, you're just trying to keep them, you know, uh, I'm trying to keep them like in the in the in the fold, I'm trying to keep you in the fold, keep you in one location. And the and the apostolic prophetic and didactic will not allow you to do that. So that's why pastors need to be covered and need to be checked and need to be got and need to be um influenced by apostles. Um it's very important. It's very, very important. They need the council of prophets. A church that is completely prophetic is com sorry, completely pastoral and evangelistic is a church that is not growing past the point of salvation. So you get you get saved, and after you get saved, that's it. Like you're just saved. Um, and you know, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, all I'm just plead the blood. All you need is the blood. The blood got power. Just the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. You ain't you ain't you don't know what you blood enough, you don't know where you flinging this blood, you don't know. What principalities or powers are in operation? You're not you're not cognizant of what's going on in the spirit. You're not even spiritual. You're not even spiritual. You're just you're just blood bought. You a vampire Christian. You just blood bought. I'm the blood, the blood, the blood. It's the blood. The, the blood. The, it will never lose its power. The blood. But you don't understand the power. The power that is within you. You don't under, you don't understand. Um, you don't understand your mantle. You don't understand the spirit that you carry. You don't understand what gifts you have, and nothing. You're just a tongue-talking, blood-bought Christian because you've never been taught to be anything more than that. You've never been taught to be any more, anything more than that. You've never been challenged to be anything more than that, and you've never been directed to be anything more than that. And so that's why, when many of you that have been um, that have been exposed and that have been uh, mainly in taught and groomed by um by app pastors and evangelists um when you get in contact with people like me um like with, with certain apostolic ministries with certain prophets and those that are committed to teaching you things you like it's like your eyes open up you're like oh my gosh i didn't know that was in the bible Oh my, look, oh, I'm starting to have dreams and visions. Jesus, what's going on? It's not new. This is the way that the church was supposed to be. Okay? Um, and 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 it's very sad that it's just now in um in Christendom that we're so, that many of you are actually beginning to be fed. It bothers me. It bothers me. Um because uh you've been guarded you've been you've been gathered you've been gathered and guarded but you have not been governed you have not been guided you have not been grounded you have not been fed you have not been pushed you have not been um positioned it's just you've just been guarded and guarded and gathered someone brought you in and you were just in the church and that's where you stayed and you never you never explored anything more you never thought about the supernatural you've never explored or tapped into your god-given um authority it's so crazy how many of you believe believe in jesus but have never cast out a devil when he said that 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 these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils literally all y'all know how to do is speak in tongues you can't l listen the sign of a believer should not just be that you speak in tongues all day. Y'all can come on a shanda da 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 sanda all the way home. But you don't heal the sick. You don't cast out no devils. Nothing. Not, not nothing. Nothing. You're just a gathered and guarded Christian. 
fivefold is not is not supposed to, fivefold. This let, let me go back to the um where what was it? It was like third slide, I think. Yes. He gave us these ministry gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ. First of all, for the perfection of the saints. The perfection. 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 How are you perfected if you don't even know how to, you can't cast out a devil? You a perfected saint and you don't cast out devils. You a perfected saint and you don't you don't heal the sick. You, you've never been corrected onto righteousness. Come on now. My job as a ministry gift is to edify you to a place that you become a steward of your own salvation. The problem when there is an overemphasis of any one gift is that you become handicapped and lopsided. When we all work together, there is a perfection. When there is an emphasis of one and not the other, then we become lopsided. And so the problem of the, one of the main biggest problems of the New Testament church, the modern church, is that we are completely and utterly pastoral and evangelistic. We will ordain a pastor in a minute. We will ordain an evangelist in a minute. You know, if I call, if I if I was coming to you as an evangelist, many people, oh yes, evangelist, yes, you preach the gospel, bring the bring the lost that win the lost at any cost. But the minute that you mention prophets or apostles, you get scared. You're like, well, I don't know about all that. You know, many false prophets have gone out into the world and blah, 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 blah. listen, if they're listen. Listen, if you do the math and you count how many prophets we have and how many pastors we have and how many evangelists we have, mathematically speaking, there should be more false pastors than false prophets. And there are more false pastors than false prophets. Because it, it ain't no way that all of y'all can be pastors. Everybody that preaches a pastor, you must be out your mind. You, you, uh, you, 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 something wrong with you. Something is wrong with you if you thought that's what it was. You thought that's what it was. I love y'all comments. There has to be balance. It takes all five to keep the church alive. It takes all five to fully express the force of the body. I'll end with this is that when Jesus resurrected and he showed himself, he appeared onto his apostles, appeared onto his disciples at the time. He was not without his scars. In fact, his scar, his hands, he showing Thomas his hands is how Thomas believed that it was really Jesus. So it would the fact that his hands were still pierced, the holes were still in his hands. It would say that the rest of his scars were still on his body as well. I could assume, or I could infer, not assume, I could infer that his, his feet were still pierced, the scars were still on his head, and the scars were still on his back. The scar was still on his on his side, and that Jesus in Jesus within himself was living and showing that he had been crucified. He had been tortured. He had been, you know, yeah, he had been beaten. And so in order for us to be the body of Christ, we have to exemplify not just his glory, but his sufferings. And the sufferings of Jesus are exemplified and communicated through the ministry gifts. He gave us apostles so we could see the scars on his back. He gave us prophets so we could see the crown of thorns on his head. He gave us pastor. He gave us 
evangelist, whichever one you want to put first, pastors or evangelists, whatever. Evangelist, so we could see the nails on his feet. He gave us pastors so we could see the nails in his hands. And he gave us teachers so we could see the spear in his side. 